surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, and so, Lord, you just heard us sing that, didn't you? Um, God, uh, we do surrender all. And so, Lord, forgive us for freaking out those times it seems like you're taking it. And, Lord, help us to hope that uh, there's no way that we could ever give more to you than you ever give to us. And, God, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about all. Lord, help us to preach. I thank you that uh, you call us to preach as a body, as a people as a witness, faithful witness to who you are in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you watch online, i kind of talking to you, because there's actually more of you that watch online that, than are here. Um, and I uh, want to say that you're part of the sanctuary. And if you're, not on the, if you're not on our mailing list, you didn't get a letter I just sent out talking about what I think we are, what we're called to be, and how you can participate. So if you'd like to read that, which would be great, I would love if you would, you can go to the church website, uh, thesanctuarydenver.org, go down to news, and click on a letter from Peter. But right now, um, First Peter, which is the best title for a book in the Bible, First Peter. Um, so... We've preached uh, so far, um, well, this is five sermons. This is our sixth sermon from uh, 1 Peter. And for the past two messages, I've wanted to tell a story, but we always run out of time. It comes from a book uh, written by Richard Wormbrand titled In God's Underground. Have any of you ever read Richard Wormbrand? Yeah, I think uh, apart from maybe... The Bible and Revelations of Divine Love by Julian of Norwich. I don't know if any book has affected me as much as In God's Wonder, er, Underground um, by Richard Wormbrand. Wormbrand was Jewish by race, Christian by faith, and a pastor by profession, which means that in Romania, several decades ago, he suffered under the Nazis. And even more, he suffered under the communists who imprisoned him and tortured him repeatedly over a span of several decades. As I read his autobiography, I remember thinking to myself, he suffered more than Jesus. And Jesus seems to say this, what happened? John 14, on the night he's betrayed, just after last, supper, after last Supper, he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Now, Peter was there. And he had already walked on water, which I think is pretty great. But that wouldn't have been the greater work that Jesus would then have been talking about. I mean, those kind of things impress us. But, you know, Jesus just doesn't seem to be all that impressed with that kind of stuff, right? I mean, Sharon shared this story. It, it was out of a nap that he calmed the waves in the sea and seemed a little frustrated that they didn't get it. Well, a few sentences later in this same conversation where he talks about the greater works, John 15, 5, Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It means that the greater works that we're called to do are actually his works, done in communion somehow with us, his body. As scripture says, he is our righteousness. So anyway, Wormbrand suffered like Christ. And at times, at times he did experience this weird, wild, supernatural joy. Well, anyway, one day, years into the imprisonment and torture, the communists threw this man named Joseph into the cell with Wormbrand. Joseph was an embittered atheist who said that he just hated God and told Wormbrand to leave him alone. Wormbrand argued with him, witnessed to him, read the Gospels to him. Joseph rejected Wormbrand's argument, but he listened as Wormbrand read the Gospels and he watched. He just watched Wormbrand live for days, weeks, months. One day, another prisoner tried to cheat Wormbrand out of his rations, a crust of broken bread. And Wormbrand said, take mine too. He said, take mine too. I know how hungry you are. And so this prisoner did, then just grunted and walked away. 
That night, Joseph said to Wormbrand, we have read nearly everything that Jesus said, but I still wonder what was he like to know as a man? Wormbrand thought for a while, and then he said to Joseph, he said, I'll tell you about a, another prisoner who asked a very same sort of question to, to a, 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 another pastor, pastor with whom I was imprisoned. When asked the question, what was Jesus like, with utmost humility, this pastor answered, he was like me. That prisoner then responded, if he was like you, then I love him too. And at that, Joseph looked at Wormbrand and said, if Jesus is like you, then I love him too. And isn't that the judgment? Do you love love? Incarnate in human flesh, standing before you on a throne. If you don't love love, how could you ever rest in the kingdom of, of love? This is the kingdom of love, the body of Christ, like we talked about last time. From outside of this body, love will look to you like death. But from inside of this body, you will experience absolute love as eternal life. Life is a communion of freely offered self-sacrifice experienced as absolute joy. So last week, we constructed this slide. Number one, life is a decision. It's to freely sacrifice yourself for another. Life is love. Number two, life is an organization. Life is the logic of love. Number three, life is a consciousness. Life is the spirit of love and the spirit of logic. Number four, all those things together, life is a communion of sacrificial love that we recognize as beautiful. Life is the good, and now you know. We got to this point by taking Scripture more seriously rather than less seriously. That is more literally rather than less literally, for lack of a, a better word. And so we're not simply like living stones. We are living stones. Bags of dust infused with whew, life. We're not simply like a temple. We actually are a temple. The temple, the living temple, the old temple destroyed but made new on the third day. Life is number one, the judgment of God, number two, the logos of God, and number three, the spirit of God incarnate in human flesh that is no longer simply human, but divine. And eternal life is the body of Christ, having risen from the temporal tomb, which is all of us, that is Adam in the image of God, the new Jerusalem, coming down. And so the wounds on our bodies become the doors of the new Jerusalem when we forgive. That is when people take our broken bread, and yet we give our broken bread. When people draw our blood, and yet we give our blood. When people take our lives, and yet we give our lives. We forgive our lives when we forgive. When we forgive, we undo the work of the evil one. Forgiveness is the death of death and the edge of eternal life. Last week, we read what Peter had to say about the living stones and the living temple with the doors wide open. And then we read this verse, 1 Peter 2.11 Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions, the, the lusts of the flesh. The lust of your flesh is to <gasps> hold your breath, wrap yourself in fig leaves, and die <laughs> forever alone, a vessel of wrath. The lust of the Spirit is love, which is sacrificial communion. In lust, literally, in lust, I have lusted to eat this meal with you, said Jesus to his bride on the night she betrayed him. 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the lusts of the flesh, which wage war against your, your soul, your sookie, you know, that blue balloon. 
against your soul, keeping your conduct among the unbelievers honorable, beautiful, good, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your beautiful deeds and glorify God, worship God on the day of visitation. What beautiful deeds are those? Would be like giving your last bit of bread to your enemy. Risking starvation like Richard Wormbrand. It would be the constant forgiveness of your enemies, whom you didn't consider as enemies, but friends. Greater love has no man than this. That's got to be a greater work, right? That he laid down his life for his friends. And now Peter's going to give us more examples. So I'm just going to read, okay, right out of the ESV. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as slaves of God, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, oikotes, house slaves, be subject to your masters with all respect. Not only the good and the gentle, but also the crooked, the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and you're beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. A body is a vessel, remember, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So there you have it. <laughs> Peter says all this stuff about how valuable each one of us are. Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's own people, living temple, body of the Messiah. And then just when we expect him to say, so stand up for yourself, demand your rights, he uses the verb hupotasso, be subject Three times in reference to three groups of people. First group, everyone. He tells everyone to subject themselves to every human institution. For example, the emperor. Number two, he fleshes this out, writing house slaves being subject to your masters. And number three, wives being subject to your husbands. Now he says a lot of stuff in between. But I think our modern American ears just hear those three things, right? Right? And a bunch of theological gobbledygook in between those th th three things. The Declaration of Independence states, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To subject yourself is not self-evident. That's not the way this world works. Now granted, to subject yourself does not mean to agree with the one who subjects you. Or to always do what the one who subjects you or you subject yourself to tells you to do. But it does mean surrender your rights. Which means that, that St. Peter, hold on to your seats... 
does not agree with Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, who cut out the portions of his Bible who did not like. Thomas Jefferson, who refused to submit to the emperor, King George of England, who owned over 600 slaves in the course of his life, who treated at least one of his wives as a slave, for she was literally one of his house slaves, Sally Hemings. And of course, their six children were also considered to be slaves because they were half black. People will say, well, that's different. Is it? You may say, well, we can't take these verses literally. Can't we? Some say Peter did not understand the implications of his statements. He didn't? Do you know who the emperor was at the time that Peter wrote these things? When he wrote, be subject to the emperor, honor the emperor. Do you know, do you know who the emperor was? Class? A guy named Nero. And Peter lived like next door. I think Peter does understand. And he understands why we would be offended. And I would like to point out that Peter did not just say, husbands, you should subjugate your wives. I think he may have just said the exact opposite. And he did not say, masters, you should enslave your slaves. And he did not say, emperors, you should crucify the Christ. So before we toss out the Bible, which is also tossing out verses like, Father, forgive them, and behold, I make all things new, and he makes everything beautiful in his time. Before we toss out the Bible, just consider a few ideas. I have to consider these ideas quite a lot. Number one, maybe we should take the Bible more literally rather than less literally. Number two, maybe all the theological gobbledygook really matters. Number three, maybe our gestalt hasn't shifted. But if we were repented, maybe we'd see things in a, in a different light. Number four, maybe Jesus and his kingdom is profoundly different than that of Thomas Jefferson in the United States of America. Number five, maybe the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, but spiritual. Number six, maybe God accomplishes all things in a rather different sort of way. Number seven, maybe when Peter wrote this, he wasn't speaking as your standard middle class, upper middle class white man like me, but something and someone else very different. Maybe when we get offended, we're not offended at Peter. We're offended at the Petra of offense, the rock of offense, the foundation stone Jesus. Maybe, maybe the first are last and the last are first. Maybe the exalted are humbled and the humbled are exalted. Maybe the losers win and the winners lose until all are lost in a dance of sacrificial love that is life. Number 10, maybe, maybe a slaughtered lamb is actually standing on the throne of God. We, we can't get to everything in this message, but if we don't sometimes paint with a broad stroke, I think we miss the forest for the trees. We miss the gasalt shift, arguing over who does the dishes and who takes out the trash. 1 Peter 2.13, time for a closer look. Be subject, hupotasso means subordinate. Be subject literally through the Lord to every human institution Thesis, creation. So right off the bat, we need to ask, what is a human institution? Uh, to ask it in the way that, that Paul would ask it, what are the principalities and powers, the world rulers of this present darkness or the darkness of this age? Or to ask it in the way John would ask it, what is the beast from the sea? And what is the beast from the land? First, I'll remind you that a human soul is God's creation, right? On the sixth day, he breathed his breath into a dust bag and made you a living soul. 
When you believed the lie and began to justify yourself for you thought that you were salvation, that is, Mises instead of Jesus, you wrapped yourself in fig leaves that you thought were a fortress but were in fact a prison, you became self-centered and began to die. That's a human creation. A human institution is a bunch of souls bound together with legislation. What Isaiah, and Isaiah I think, calls a covenant with death, a covenant of self-centeredness. And in, in other words, a bunch of individuals agree to help each other be self-centered. It's faith in Mises in order to save Mises. That's a human creation. Human institutions are actually rather easy to grow if you simply incorporate these three tools. Number one, promises. You promise to protect individual rights, which is a promise that you cannot help but break. But you promise to protect individual rights as long as those individuals agree to a covenant, your collective knowledge of good and evil. And number two, threats. You let individuals know that if they break the terms of the covenant, they will be separated from the group, which is death. And number three, scapegoating. It's a term that has become really popular in recent decades among sociologists and theologians, particularly since the publication of the book Violence and the Sacred by the French sociologist René Girard. The term scapegoating itself comes from Leviticus chapter 16. It's the kind of Old Testament I think that Christians hardly ever read because it just freaks us out. It describes Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. It's the one day that the high priest, you know, was to enter the Holy of Holies behind the veil, which separated the eternal presence of God from us dirtbags, into whom God had already breathed his spirit. Leviticus 16, through Moses, God tells Aaron the high priest that, that once a year he is to make atonement for himself, and then through this bizarre ritual, he is to make atonement for the people of Israel. He was to cast lots over two goats to determine which goat would be the sin offering and which goat would be the scapegoat. He was to then offer, sacrifice the sin offering, which is distinct from the burnt offering, which was usually a sheep. A lamb, incidentally, like the Passover lamb, this is really important to remember, um, could be a goat or a sheep. When he was to, to sacrifice the, the sin offering, well, he was to sacrifice the sin offering first, the body of which would be burned outside of the camp, and then the blood was to be brought behind the veil, and get this, sprinkled on the very throne of God. But then Aaron is commanded to take the other goat, the scapegoat, and present it alive to the Lord, place his hands on his head, and confess over it, quote, all the iniquities of the people of Israel. Leviticus 16, 21. And this goat is not to be sacrificed. It's to be released into the wilderness of Azazel, which literally means something like where the goat goes. Scripture doesn't really even say what Azazel is. So some think Azazel is some kind of freaky weird demon. Others say, no, it's got to be some kind of particular wilderness somewhere over in Palestine. Whatever it is, it must be something like the outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth because they are imprisoned in sorrow, self-hatred, and sin. Yahweh says, the goat shall bear all their iniquities, the iniquities of Israel, on itself to a remote area, Leviticus 16, 22. And now this is what's so crazy about all of this. If all of the iniquities of Israel are on the scapegoat, then none of the iniquities of Israel were atoned for with the sin offering. And so just like the author of Hebrew writes, the blood of bulls and goats cannot atone for sin. And all that means that all the sacrifices in the temple were like a dry run for something else. And the sins of Israel were still on the scapegoat in Azazel. Well, Gerard and his disciples kind of seem to ignore that fact but they make a very helpful and insightful point. Human institutions are built on scapegoating. That is blaming 
someone or something for everything. So if I'm running for president, number one, I'll promise to protect the rights of a group of people. Now, I'll say that I will protect the rights of all people, but because our so-called rights almost always conflict with other people's so-called rights, well, I'll end up emphasizing the rights of the group with which I'm most popular. Republican or Democrat, left or, or right, it doesn't matter, you see, because it's all the same process. Number two, I'll threaten those that would violate those rights. And number three, I'll find a scapegoat. And I will blame all of our troubles on the scapegoat. The scapegoat can be a person, but is usually a group of people. That is another human institution with which we're competing. I'll build my institution by reassuring my group of people that they're in. And those others are out, and I'm going to keep them out. The scapegoat. Right now, Palestinians are scapegoating Jews. And Jews are scapegoating, and they've been scapegoating for quite a while, the Palestinians. Scapegoating. Largely because the Germans scapegoated the Jews um, after World War I. And they scapegoated the Jews largely because Allied powers scapegoated the Axis powers um, at the end of World War I. You see, we can all keep blaming like this. We can keep blaming and blaming and blaming and blaming until we find ourselves in a garden talking to a snake at the foot of a tree. Governments, cultures, classes, races, even maybe especially churches can all be human institutions and they grow by scapegoating. So how do you conquer the beast? Principalities and powers. You know, people say that Christians conquered the Roman Empire. And I think that's true. Other people say, well, actually, the Roman Empire conquered the church. And I think that's also true. For the living temple became a stone temple. And if you know your church history, you know that's when our scapegoating really kicked into high gear. Because we began to say that those who don't agree with our rules will remain in Azazel forever and ever and ever and ever without end. Do you know that Catholic means universal? Which means that Roman Catholic means the universe that is Roman. But leave it to us Americans to shrink that universe down to something like Pentecostal free will, General Baptists of, I don't know, the Northern County or something like that. In 1990, as I told you, I got to travel to Romania right after their revolution where I met with those that had started the revolution and toppled the despot, the dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu. It, it, it all began a week before Christmas. Or that actually, that's not when it began. That's when it came to a head the week before Christmas. Some, some Romanian believers just gathered around the home of Laszlo Tokish, a Lutheran pastor who was thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. They gathered around his home. They just held hands and they began singing Christmas carols. And then when the secret police opened fire, they didn't stop. They kept singing. Many of them marched to the central square uh, where they were joined uh, with others. The authorities gunned them down. They stacked the bodies in front of the state-run church. It was this stone building at the other end of the central square, a stone building in which the priests would hide behind locked doors. But at the other end, in, in front of the opera house, the worshipers gathered and kept singing. They wouldn't stop singing until on Christmas Day, my friend Peter Dugulescu led an estimated 100,000 Romanians in the Lord's Prayer. What had been illegal for over 40 years, they recited from memory, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. I think they were saying if Jesus is like Petru Dugulescu, Laszlo Tokish, Richard Wormbrand, 
we love him too. And we're ready to die with you. You see, it wasn't an army that toppled the despot Nikolai Ceausescu. It was people like Richard Wormbrand who let an enemy take their crust of bread. 1 Peter 2.13, be subject literally through the Lord to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him, the emperor, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of Aphron, people without knowledge, ignorant people, the ignorance of ignorant people. Now notice that Peter just referred to the emperor as a human creation when he would argue that he was a god, as a human creation, and uh, he referred to the emperor as, as ignorant. It means in the words of Jesus, he knows not what he's doing. Verse 16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as slaves of God. There's a concept that would be a free slave. Only the slaves of God are free in Peter's mind. Only the slaves of God will what they want and then actually want what they will. We're all, the rest of us are deceived by, I guess, weird lusts and passions. Verse 17, honor, value everyone. Would Peter write value everyone if he really believed that his best friend Jesus would now torture a whole bunch of people, in, torture anyone endlessly, forever and ever and ever? Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor, value the emperor. How slaves, oikites, being subject, so he's panning out the everyone subject thing, being subject to your despots, despotes. With all respect or fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the crooked. For this is literally, and this is, the Greek's pretty simple, this is grace. When conscious of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Literally, this is grace. God is grace. God is relentless love. 1965, as you know, 100 armed federal marshals escorted six-year-old Ruby Bridges to school every day. Because every day there was a mob of 1,000 to 1,500 white people screaming invectives at little, uh, little, at little Ruby. They, they had made Ruby their scapegoat. Just before I went to Romania, I had the privilege of hearing the renowned Harvard-educated psychiatrist Dr. Coles speak at a convention that I attended. Dr. Coles had been assigned to Ruby by a federal, jo a federal judge uh, concerned for her mental well-being. At first, Ruby mystified Dr. Coles because she just seemed so well-adjusted, so happy and free. You know, so much life, liberty, and happiness. One day, her teacher informed Dr. Coles that as Ruby was crossing the street in front of the school that morning, she noticed out of the window that Ruby had stopped. And she just started speaking to, to the crowd. Speaking to the crowd as they screamed invectives and curses at her. The federal marshals had stopped as well, and then they had just let her speak. And so that night at their session, Dr. Coles, Dr. Coles questioned Ruby. He said, Ruby, why did you speak to those people this morning? And she said, well, I didn't. When Dr. Coles explained why he was asking the question, she said, well, I wasn't speaking to them. I was praying. He said, it didn't bother you to pray in front of those people? And she said, well, no. I was praying for those people. A bit incredulous at this point, he said, you were praying for them? And she said, well, yeah. Don't you think they need praying for? Well, don't you think someone else should pray for them, said Dr. Coles? Well, no, said Ruby. I'm the one who hears what they're saying. Mystified, Dr. Coles said, okay, Ruby, we know why you were praying. What do you pray he says, well, that's easy. I always pray the same thing. I say, please, God, 
Try and forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. Verse 20. For what glory is it if when you sin and are beaten, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer, you endure? This is grace from God. The Greek's really, literally, really clear. Literally, this is grace from God. It wasn't just Ruby that was praying. And who does need praying for? The poor or the rich? The weak or the powerful? The last or the first? The humbled or the exalted? The slaves or the despots? The crucified or the crucifiers? Those that love their enemies or those that have trapped themselves in outer darkness, weep and gnash in their teeth because they hate grace and long for retribution because they think vengeance belongs to them. The slaves or the masters. You know, there are two ways that you could destroy the diabolical institution of slavery. Number one, you could turn everyone into a master. You'd probably use legislation to do that. So that each would perpetually demand their own rights and build an impenetrable fortress around their soul. Or two, if it were possible, you could maybe entice people. Ultimately, romance everyone into freely choosing to become a slave like yourself until everyone surrendered their rights and gladly bled for their neighbor. The brilliant Dr. Coles, he said to all of us at the convention that six-year-old Ruby had changed his life. He must have thought, if Jesus is like you, then I love him too. To his disciples, arguing over who was first, Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In Aramaic, many often means all, and so hopefully that includes you. Verse 21, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. I think it's really diabolical, but rich, powerful American Christians have convinced people that Jesus suffered so that, you know, we wouldn't have to suffer. When Scripture clearly teaches that Jesus suffered so that we would suffer like him and with him. It's also rich, powerful American Christians that seem to be utterly mystified by the atonement Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself, literally handing himself over, to him who judges justly, that's rightly. He himself bore Anna Pharaoh to carry up, to put on the altar, our sins in his body on the tree, the skulon, the wood, the timber, the tree, that that literally, having been severed from sin, we might live in the righteousness by his wounds, the wounds of the righteousness, by his wounds, the doors to the new Jerusalem, you've been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned, returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Those blue bubbles. Commentators will be quick to point out that those four verses we just read are Peter's recitation of Isaiah 53. And most agree that Isaiah 53 is about the scapegoat. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That sounds like the scapegoat. But Isaiah 53, 12 and 1 Peter talk about him bearing up or carrying up our sins on the wood. You know, like a sacrifice placed on the wood or Jesus placed on the tree. You see, I think scripture clearly teaches that Jesus is the scapegoat. The scapegoat that abolishes sin, Hebrews 9, 26, by... 
the sacrifice of himself. And that paints an amazing picture. Number one, there were no actual sins forgiven in the temple with the sacrifice of goats. Number two, apart from Jesus, our sins are not forgiven, but in Azazel. Number three, what is Azabel? Azel? What is Azazel? Well, maybe it's us. Wandering in the wilderness like sheep that are lost in shame and just blind to the shepherd. Sin is taking the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil to make ourselves in the image and likeness of God. But when we take knowledge of the good, we also take the life. Jesus is the life. We take the life of the good and we call it our own. The life is in the blood. The breath. It's in the blood. Sin is taking the life of Christ on the school on the tree in the garden. We imprison it in earthen vessels, which are our own arrogant egos. We imprison life in us like a breath in a balloon, like blood in a clot, like blood in a vessel of wrath that refuses to bleed the mercy of God, like Azazel. Azazel is the location of sin that is not sacrificed. That is life or breath that is not returned to the one who gave it. And yet if Christ is the scapegoat, then Christ is in Azazel with us, even as us. So number four, on Palm Sunday, the Lord whom we sought suddenly came to his temple and we made him what he always was, our scapegoat. And on Good Friday, he laid his life down. He laid our stolen lives down. He expired the breath that Adam had been holding within himself. And on Easter, God inspired his breath into all of us, and we began to love as he loves. And in other words, Jesus repented us. Righteousness in us is Christ rising within us and always bringing us home to the heart of the Father behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies, the beating heart of God. Life is not demanding our rights. Life is surrendering our rights. Not to Nero, but to the righteousness of God, which is the logic of love. Gerard and his disciples claim that the sacrifice of Christ is the end of all sacrifice because it reveals how evil all of our scapegoating has been. And it does reveal how evil all of our scapegoating has been. Whatever we do to the least of these, who would be the least of these? That would be our scapegoat, right? Whatever we do to the least of these, we do to him. It reveals how evil all of our scapegoating has been. But, but it's not the end of all sacrifice, Christ is actually the beginning of true sacrifice and the revelation of how good the scapegoat is. In fact, sacrifice is the very definition of love. In this is love, writes John. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son, the only begotten God, that's what John writes in First John, the only begotten, or in John 1, the only begotten God from the bosom of the Father. His heart sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The sacrifice of Christ then is the knowledge of evil, but it's also the knowledge of the good, which is the life. A communion of sacrifice and freedom that is life in the body of Christ. And so how do we conquer the evil institutions of this world? Well, the same way that Jesus conquered old Jerusalem. What did the scapegoat do?
Well, he allowed all of us to blame him, right? To scapegoat him. And on Good Friday, just outside the city walls, he refused to blame us. Instead, he cried, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the good. And they don't know the life. And then he bled the life, which is all life for all of us to see. The one who loves much is the one who knows that he's forgiven much. You have been forgiven much. And one day you will know, for you will watch all your scapegoats, the last and the least of these, begin to bleed for you. Your angry old self is being romanced by the king of kings just outside your city walls. And so your walls will come tumbling down. And when they do, you may think that you're dying, but in reality, you're just being born. The best of us is only just beginning uh, to live. You know what that is? That's the new Jerusalem coming down. And that's the living temple. Chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, gunaikos, this is the one place this word is used in all the Bible, the feminine, being subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one, romanced without a word by the conduct of their wives. Verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives according to knowledge. They are co-heirs, heirs with you of the grace of life. Now, there's so much more to talk about in these verses, and we will. But for now, let me just suggest that maybe Peter, Paul, and John actually believed what they wrote, in which case they believed that they are, and we are, actually the feminine. In other words, the bride of Christ. And so... One flesh with Christ, that is his body. So maybe, 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 maybe Peter actually felt as if he had denied his beloved on the very night that his beloved vowed himself to him with body broken and blood shed. Peter denied him and then watched as he refused to deny Peter in return. Instead, Jesus forgave Peter just as he always had planned to do. So now Peter didn't feel like he had to love Jesus more than anything in this world. He wanted to love Jesus the way that Jesus had always loved him. The death of Peter is clearly attested by several first and second century sources. He died in 64 AD because Emperor Nero needed scapegoats upon whom to blame the fires that he had started in order to clear Rome of its slums. And, and yet Peter wrote, value everyone. Value the emperor. According to one second century text, the church in Rome had received word that Peter was going to be arrested and executed, and so the church in Rome begged Peter to flee the city, and although he protested, he finally gave in. But as he was fleeing the city on the road out of town, he had a vision of Jesus, and Jesus was walking in the other direction, not away from the city, but toward the city. Peter said, my Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to Rome to be crucified. 
And at that, Peter turned around, ran back into Rome, and requested to be crucified like Jesus. With Jesus. Some say he was crucified upside down. But I hope you get this. Listen closely. Peter isn't saying the emperor is right, is he? He's not saying the emperor is right, the slave owners are right, or your controlling husband is right. He's saying they're wrong. And this is how we make them right. We're here this morning not because someone demanded their rights from King George or Emperor Nero. We're here this morning because people like Peter laid all their rights down at the feet of Jesus, who had laid all of his rights down at our feet and still lays them down in us and even asks us his body. Peter suffered for Jesus, but you can bet that Jesus still suffered in Peter. It was the greater works that we would do. It's the work that he does in us, his body. For he will not leave us nor forsake us, and apart from him, we can do nothing. So maybe you're being repressed by a heartless institution. You're a scapegoat. Maybe you're being abused by someone, like a slave, a living sacrifice. Maybe you're suffering in a dead marriage. You're a victim of a broken covenant. Well, if that's the case, be a victim with Jesus. And unto the Lord God, our Father, and soon you will see, you will suddenly see that you are like standing on the throne of God and beginning to experience more life, liberty, and happiness than your little earthen vessel could ever have even begun to bear. Soon you will see that love bears all things. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love wins. The life wins. And so on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, the day he was betrayed by all of us, the sixth day, the life took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Dark cups are wine. Blue cups are juice. And the life is in the blood. And it's not a little bit of life. It's an endless river of life, eternal life. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen. Amen. And so God bless you and keep you. He's all around you. He's with you. May you believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.